నమస్కారం సద్గురు వైఆర్ వి సో అఫ్రైడ్ ఆఫ్ డెత్ why there is so much fear is the substance of your life is only in your clothes your jewels your education a few people that you gathered around you that's all the substance of your life is all these things can be taken away from you any moment isn't it this is the only thing which is giving you solidity yes that little bit of education your clothes your jewels your bank balance a few people around you this is all that is giving you some sense of solidity of being a being this is not a being this is a patch up job so with such petty blocks when you build a building naturally you should be very worried when it will collapse now instead of using a stone block for this column if i use the twig definitely i'll be always worried when it will collapse on my head isn't it isn't it so that's your worry that's your fear because you're trying to build your life with twigs not with solid material not with reality with illusory things always you will live in fear there is no other way to live there is simply if you're living in a house which is supported by twigs being afraid that it will collapse on your head is very natural isn't it that's all that's happened to you it's time you build some you bring something more substantial into your life if you bring something more substantial then suddenly you find if you sit here everything is fine life or death still it is fine this how it will be a very beautiful story buddha on the last day of his life He always had a breakfast of rice gruel in the morning. And after this breakfast was over, he always met the monks who were around him. And every day he said, if you have a question, you ask. This went on for 40 years. 40 years of his enlightened life. Every day after breakfast, he spoke. Whoever was there, 10 people, 10,000 people, whatever number after breakfast he always sat down and spoke so on the last day of his life he knows this is the last day he had his rice gruel and he sat down and he said today is the last day if you have anything to ask ask so many of the monks started crying said what are you crying at least some other day if you are crying it's okay today is the last day don't waste the time because <laughs> it's ticking away some other day you could cry and roll and you had time for all those things today if you want to ask something you ask he was surprised that people are crying but master we have been with you for so long you're leaving today and they're crying nobody asking any questions he said stop this nonsense ask some questions Today is the last day. Any doubt? Let's clear it. After that, there is only teaching. Nobody to clear this and that. All the… See, with every teaching, you can get into a mess. When the master is alive, constantly is de-entangling you. Afterwards, no de-entangling, just sadhana is all that is there. So, today is the last day. If you want to ask any questions, please ask. It's just matter of fact about it. He's lived well. When death comes, he will die well. He's so certain that he'll die well. So, it's just another day. One day you took on the body, another day you walked about with the body, another day you leave the body. You make a big issue out of it, simply because you have a keyhole vision of life. As Kala Bhairava, he is a destroyer of time. What you call as life, order approaching death, is only because of time. Shukracharya just revives them with the Sanjivini mantra. Then Shiva said, there is no need to kill him, I will contain him. Whatever I try to do, I become that.
If I dispense death, I become death. One who constantly feels death within himself, his life will reverberate across the existence. For most people, who I am is not apparent in the way I live. Probably you will know who I am just by seeing the way I die. Is it absolutely inevitable that a Buddha will always be misunderstood? Prem Madhira, yes, it is absolutely inevitable. It can't be otherwise. A Buddha is bound to be misunderstood. If a Buddha is not misunderstood, then he is not a Buddha at all. Why it is so? Because the Buddha lives in a state which is beyond mind. And we live in minds. To translate something from the beyond to the mind is the most impossible thing in the world. It can't be done, although every Buddha has tried to do it. That too is inevitable. No Buddha can avoid it. The Buddha has to say the unsayable. He has to express the inexpressible. He has to define the indefinable. He has to do this absurd act because the moment he reaches beyond the mind, great compassion arises. He can see people stumbling in the dark. He can see people suffering unnecessarily, creating their own nightmares, creating their own hell, and drowning in their own created hells. How can he avoid not feeling compassion. And the moment compassion arises, he wants to communicate to them that this is your own doing, that you can get out of it, that there is a way out of it, that there is a state beyond it, that life is not what you think it is. Your thinking about life is just like the thinking of a blind man about light. The blind man can go on thinking about light, but he will never be able to come to a true conclusion. His conclusions may be very logical, but still they will miss the experience. Light is an experience. You don't need logic for it. What you need is eyes. Buddha has eyes. And eyes are attained only when you have gone beyond the mind, when you have become a witness of the mind, when you have attained to a higher state than psychology, when you know that you are not your thoughts, not your body, when you know that you are only knowing 
the energy that reflects the energy that is capable of seeing that you are pure seeing once buddha was asked who are you he was such a beautiful man and the buddhahood has conferred such grace to him that many times he is asked who are you he looked like an emperor or a god who has come from the heaven and he lived like a beggar again and again he is asked who are you and the man who was asking was a great scholar he said are you from the world of gods are you a god buddha said no then are you a gandharva gandharvas are the musicians of the gods buddha had such music around himself the music of silence the sound of no sounds one hand clapping that it was natural to ask him are you a gandharva a celestial musician buddha said no and the man goes on asking there are many categories in hindu mythology from gods to men then finally he ask are you a great king a chakravarti one who rules over the world and buddha says no anayat the scholar asked are you a man or not even that buddha said don't be anayat but what can i do i have to state the truth as it is i am not a man either now the scholar is too much angry enraged he says then are you a, an animal buddha said no not an animal not a tree not a rock then who are you the man asked buddha said i am awareness just pure awareness just a mirror reflecting all that is when this moment arrives great compassion happens buddha has said that those who know are bound to feel compassion for those who don't know they start trying to help and the first thing that has to be done is to communicate to people who are blind that eyes are possible that you are not really blind is the nature of the moon may tend is a special pornami or a special full moon day because it's called buddha pornami this is the day gautama the buddha got enlightened you know this this year it's on 10th of may this full moon day is the day gautama the buddha got enlightened there are many aspects to his life the most important aspect is that he is a buddha that's not his name his name is gautama siddhartha but he is a buddha buddha means he transcended his intellect bu means buddhi dha means dada buddhi means the intellect dada means one who is above one who is above his intellect is a buddha one who is in his intellect is a non stop suffering human being <laughs> something happens they suffer nothing happens they suffer whichever way <laughs> that is if you are below the mind we call them buddhu you're missing the point if you are above the mind you are a buddha 
If you're below the mind, you're a buddhu. If you're in the mind, you're non-stop suffering. <laughs> so how did he become this? He tried many things in his life. He was a prince of a small princely state because uh, some yogi predicted that this will either become a great emperor or become a great sage. When he made this prediction, the father got little excited. He did not want him to become a great sage, he wanted to become a great emperor. So he decided he will not expose him to… because he thought by ex being exposed to some suffering or misery, he may turn into a sage. So he kept him in utter pleasure, in the best of food, best of clothes, best of pleasures, everything. When he was eight, nineteen years of age, he got him married to a very pretty young woman, kept him in a palace secluded from the rest of the society, where he lives in pleasure, never exposed to any kind of suffering. One day he thought he will just take a drive through the town. He asked his charioteer to take him across. So he was going and then he saw a man who was old, was going like this. So he had never seen an old man in his life. His father had protected him from all this. He said, what happened to him? So the chariot said, oh, he's just an old man. How does it happen? he asked. He said, everybody gets old someday. He looked at himself, he was a nice youth. What, me also? He said, yes, everybody, everybody gets old. They live long enough, they get old. He, he, this was a realization for him, I will become like this. Then he saw a man lying on the street who was ill with something, not able to get up in great suffering. He said, stop, what is this guy? What's he doing? He said, oh, he's sick unfortunately. What does that mean? He said, my body, sometimes it gets sick. It can happen to anybody. It can happen to just anybody. Me, a prince, it can happen to me. It can happen to anybody. Then he said, oh, I can become like this. Then they were going further, he was completely disturbed by this. Then he saw a funeral. They were carrying a dead body of a man. What happened to that guy? Oh, he just died. What does that mean? That happens to everybody without exception. Then he said, what am I doing? Just eating pleasures, nonsense, what am I doing with myself? And he struggled, he went into turmoil within himself. This suddenly being a prince and these pleasures and all this palace suddenly broke apart for him and he started looking, what is the point? of all this, this is going to get old, this may get sick, for sure this will be dead. What am I investing my entire life in this? But by then he had an infant boy. He looked at his wife and his child, this loving wife and this lovely little baby, he could not leave. He struggled and struggled and struggled. By then, a little over one and a quarter years passed. When the boy was one and a half years of age, he could not hold it anymore. In the middle of the night, like a thief, without telling anybody, he slipped out of the palace and left for good. He went in search, I want to know the truth about this life. He went from school to school, these are times when different schools were established in India, at one point there were over eighteen hundred schools. I'm saying not just institutions, eighteen hundred different ways of doing things 
eighteen hundred different varieties of yoga. Not the kind that you're seeing in California, somebody doing like this, somebody doing like this, really intricate expressions. It is like how the medical science is becoming today. Twenty-five years ago, you wanted a medical checkup, all you needed was your family doctor. Today, <laughs> for every part of your body, there is a doctor. I was… Uh, a few years ago, I had a… you know, I had a knee injury, I was playing soccer and I broke something in the knee. And I was all packed up and I was speaking. That's how I got into golf, because of this knee injury. <laughs> Somebody told me, <laughs> gifted me a golf kit and said, Sadhguru, you're too old for any other game, you just play golf. <laughs> so I was sitting there in Atlanta and talking, speaking at a place. Then I was in pain, I couldn't even move. So after the… when this is over, I mean when I was speaking, one person raised his hand, I thought he wants a question. But then he said, uh, Sadhguru, I would like to examine your knee after this is over, I'm a knee doctor. I said, come on, you're an orthopedic. So, no, no, I'm a knee doctor. Then I said, right or left? <laughs> Which one are you? <laughs> so specialization, specialization is going. A time will come probably in fifty years' time, if you want a medical checkup, you need one hundred doctors to check you. By the time you get these one hundred appointments, <laughs> maybe you need an undertaker. <laughs> then it'll become ridiculous. Okay, you went to three doctors, all right. You went to five doctors, all right. If it becomes fifty hundred doctors for a medical checkup, it's become ridiculous, isn't it? This happened to yogic system. People started specializing and specializing in variety of small things. Each specialization has a whole thing by itself. Someone just came and told me they're a dentist, okay? I'm not speaking in any of this thing. For example, dentistry, just thirty-two teeth, all right? They study for nine years, thirty-two teeth, nine years of study. Still, they don't know everything about it. That's the nature of creation. If you start studying one tooth at a time, you will see each one of them has something specific about it. You… somebody can spend a lifetime of study just learning about one tooth. Just say if you had thirty-two dentists to look into your mouth, <laughs> disaster you are, isn't it? <laughs> so as specialization, specialization happens, when it crosses a certain point, it'll become ridiculous. This happened to yoga. It crossed that point where eighteen hundred schools, different specializations of yoga happened. So that is when Patanjali came and kind of assimilated everything into yoga sutras to minimize this expanse that was growing endlessly. So when Gautama came, it was post Patanjali but still there were many things. So he went from school to school, he pursued eight different forms of samadhi. We're talking about samadhi, okay <laughs> He pursued eight different forms of samadhi. He saw all of them were wonderful experiences, but still it did not liberate him. So in this condition, he was walking as a samana, there's a certain system of practice called as samanas. Their fundamental practice is this, they will never ask for food. You should not go in pursuit of food because they want to beat the fundamental instinct of survival. No matter what, you're always going in pursuit of food, please understand this. You may complicate it in so many ways, but fundamentally, you're talking so much about economy means you're just thinking about survival all the time, isn't it? Survival glorified, but still it is survival. So one fundamental sadhana for them is, you never pursue your instinct of survival. You simply keep going. So samanas used to just walk. 
never asking for food. But the culture was sensitive. If they saw a spiritual person walking, people will cook at home and run behind him and serve him wherever he is because they know he will not ask for food. Today if you become a samana, you will walk yourself to death <laughs> Those days people were sensitive to his sadhana and responded. So there were thousands of samanas walking the country. So Gautama became a samana. And even if you are not asking for food, you will walk near a town. So the food will come. But Gautama took it too seriously and just walked. He became all bones, just bones and a bag of skin, like that he became. Then he came to a place where there was a river called Niranjana. Unfortunately, that river is gone now, no more river. Just about eighteen to twenty inches of water, maybe moving little rapidly. He stepped into it, halfway down into the river, he did not have the energy to cross. There was a tree branch, a dead branch, he just held on to it. He doesn't have the strength to take the next step, but he is not the kind of man to let go. He held on, we don't know for how long, people say for a very long time, maybe it was two minutes. When you're feeling so weak, those two minutes might have looked like many years. Then as he hung on, he just realized, what is it that I'm striving for? What is it I'm wandering the entire country, growing from school to school, learning this, learning that, what is it that I'm looking for? Then he realized, there's really nothing. This life is on. All I have to do is just take away the barriers which are not allowing me to experience this. When he realized that everything is within him, there's no way to search, suddenly he had the energy to take the next step and the next step he crossed the river, came and sat down under that now very famous Bodhi tree, which has become more famous than the Buddha himself. Uh, a part of the tree, a remnant or a, a progeny of the tree still exists in Bodhgaya. And he sat under the tree, it was this full moon night which is coming now, on 10th of May. He sat there and he sat there with this determination, either I must see the ultimate nature of my existence now or I will sit here and die. I will not open my eyes till I know this. Once he made the resolve, because the only problem is there is no resolve. Every two minutes your intentions are changing. If you are totally on, to know what is within you, how long should it take? Hmm? It should happen in a moment, isn't it? Because there is no distance to travel. Time is a quantity which is necessary only when there is a distance to travel, isn't it? If there is no distance to travel, if I ask you, how long does it take for you to sit here? You're already sitting. It's already there. It doesn't take any time. So you're already alive and on. It doesn't take any time for realization because you don't have to do anything particular. When he saw this, he was fully enlightened and the moon was shining. And he had not eaten for many months on end properly, years, actually four years he was a samana. And people around him, he had gathered about five disciples, I think. These guys thought he's real because he doesn't eat, he's really rigid. And they saw he's in some state, exuberant state, and they could see the light on his face. Then they were waiting for him to open his eyes and give the teaching. He opened his eyes, looked at them, smiled and said, cook something, let's eat. <laughs> they were totally disappointed, they thought he's lost it. They walked with him for four to eight years when he had nothing but torture. 
When he got enlightened, they left him <laughs> because they wanted to hear something severe. He said, cook something, let's eat. We've been wasting our time <laughs> There are many beautiful episodes in his life. When he one day walked upon the river bank after he has become a Buddha and went and sat down under a tree. Tree, not because tree is the best place to sit under, you know, ants can get you. Because that was the only real estate of those times. There are no buildings and buildings and buildings everywhere. So tree was a good place, a pleasant place to sit under. Rather than sitting in harsh sun, you sit under a tree. An astrologer who was of great proficiency in his trade saw the footprint on the riverbank. He had come to… In, the, in India, people of any… this thing means… bath means always river. Those rivers are going away, I will tell you later. Bath means always river. So he came for a bath, the river, then he saw the footprint. There is a whole science or rather observations through which by looking at the way one's feet is, somebody predicts exactly what he will do. So he saw the footprint and then he saw that this is the footprint of an emperor, somebody who should rule the world. Then he wondered, why would such a person be in this remote place near a jungle? Then he followed the footprint, thinking he will meet an emperor. Then he saw this monk, Gautama, sitting under a tree. Then he looked at this, this… he thought either my astrology has gone all wrong or I'm being fooled or I'm in some kind of a hallucination. What's happening here? Then he went to Gautama and asked, who are you? Uh, Gautama, was uh, in this kind of just jeet kind of state. <laughs> he said, I'm nobody, I'm just a nobody. But you have the feet of an emperor, you should conquer the world. Gautama said, that I will, but not by conquest. See, there are two ways you can have the world either by conquest or by inclusion, yes? I can make you yours, either by capturing you, chaining you and making you do what I want or by including you as a part of myself, yes? Both ways, something or somebody becomes yours, isn't it? But if you go by conquest, it will be a pain in your neck always. If you include, this will become a great enhancement of life. He said, I am the emperor of the world. But then he said, you're a monk, you own nothing. I own nothing and I am a nobody. That is why everything is mine. Even mathematicians are trying to teach you the zero and the infinite are one and the same. Hmm? So you becoming a no-thing does not mean you're no use. You are a no-thing means you have become all-inclusive, isn't it? You are something means you can only be that. You are a no-thing, you can be any way you want. This is how this life is made. If your ability to respond is not curtailed, you can be anything you wish at any given moment, isn't it? So Gautama said, I'm anyway the emperor of the world, if that's a word you like, but I'm actually a nobody because everything is anyway mine. If you see I'm responsible for everything, everything is yours, isn't it? How does somebody become yours? Hmm? Because you own them or you take responsibility for them? Because you take responsibility for them, they become yours, not otherwise, isn't it? If you own them forcefully, they will never be yours. 
Yes or no? Yes. If you forcefully own somebody, will they ever be yours? No. They'll never ever be yours. So this astrologer sat down. He said, you are a monk, you have nothing, on top of it you say, you are just Jeet, I'm sorry. <laughs> on top of it you say, I am a nobody and everything is yours. What is this? Gautama said, you come, I have a way for you. You are busy making predictions of life. I have a plan. Why do you make predictions of life? You are incapable of making a plan and executing a plan. That is why you fall back on a predictions, isn't it? <coughs> yes or no? If you are capable of making a plan and executing the plan, would you fall back on predictions? No. No. So Gautama said, you are busy making predictions. I am here, I have a plan. Come, become a part of my plan. We'll make something else happen. You must become a part of this plan. We can make something wonderful happen. This same world, this same world can be turned into paradise if all, us, all of us go by a paradise plan, isn't it? Yes, yes or no? Yes. The question is only, do that because between a possibility and a reality there is a distance or do we have the courage and the commitment to walk the distance, that's all it is.